It aims to create an environment for students which ensure their overall development and growth. Now I would like to take the honor of inviting on behalf of School of Education, Adonis University, a highly experienced educator and executive coach, Dr. N. Ferrante. She is clinical professor of organizational behavior at the University of Texas at Dallas. She is also a certified executive coach on retainer with the School of Public Affairs at American University in Washington, D.C. She has PhD in human and organizational development from the Field and Organizational Institute. She also holds an MBA and MS both from Rutger University. She has completed the UTD executive and professional coaching program and is an international coach federation professional certificate coach. Certified coach, she imparts knowledge and uh, expertise deprived from successful corporate and academic careers. Our School of Education, Adamus University, totally cherishes you and your presence, ma'am, and welcomes you to today's session. Before invi inviting ma'am, I would like to request the participants to mute yourself and maintain the decorum of the session. Also, your active participation is appreciated and do write your questions in the chat box for the ma'am to interact in the later half. Thank you all and over to you ma'am. Well, thank you very much, Sushmita. I'm delighted to be with you today um, and to really discuss this topic. Uh, when Dr. Goon and I spoke about the invitation and uh, shared with me a little bit about you, uh, the audience, and uh, what your intentions are in your careers and what some ideas of what she thought was helpful for you to learn. I took that information and I did what I usually do <laughs> before I teach or before I present anything is I think about it a little bit. And that's what I did in designing today's uh, presentation for you. And I called it Teaching is Leadership. And uh, as you know, probably from my background, the short story there is that, you know, I currently uh, teach uh, adult learners at the graduate level. And I also currently uh, coach uh, people, uh, uh, usually professionals. I, I don't really do personal coaching, but I do uh, coach professionals on their leadership skills. And having doing both of them over the years made me realize there is a connection between teaching and leadership. And I wanted to share that with you today. I don't know if it's an automatic um, perception that you have about uh, teaching and or leadership. And one of the main goals today is to hopefully uh, share some information with you that informs you in a different way and allows you to think about uh, what teaching really, really is. So um, let me get my um, uh, PowerPoint up. That's necessary here to start. Yes, ma'am, totally, yes. Okay, and now we can see it. Is that correct? Everyone can see? Yes, ma'am, right. it's visible. Great. Uh, well, we've succeeded already, right? <laughs> we can That's see good, the screen yeah. and you can hear me. Now, one thing I have to really say to all of you and reiterate, please mute. If if I am speaking and I start to hear noise and and, you know, it's not helping the learners, the listeners, and it's certainly not helping me. So please double check that you are muted. And I appreciate that very much. Thank you. Okay, so the first place to start, I think usually is with a definition, right? And we're gonna talk about these two topics, uh, teaching and leadership. So um, let's start with definitions. And you probably have your own definition based on what you do or what you're teaching or what you know or your experiences of having been taught. But I'm just using sort of textbook, uh, you know, published 
uh, definitions for teaching and leadership today to start us off. Teaching is the process, right? It's not a person, it's a process of attending to people's needs, experiences, and feelings, and imparting knowledge and skill. That imparting knowledge and skill, I think, is usually the first reaction that we have when we hear the word teaching or teacher, that somebody's going to impart knowledge and skill. The second part is also very important, and we're going to be talking about that quite a bit today, and that is creating an environment, creating an environment in which others can and will learn effectively. Okay, so two things, um, a process of, of acknowledging, attending to people's needs, experiences, and feelings, and imparting knowledge, and then creating the environment. Okay, definition. Now, this is from my one of the textbooks that I use. Um, leadership is the process, okay, the second word, process, that we're hearing for the second time. It's a process, it's a methodology, it's a way, right, of influencing other people, influencing, and also providing an environment to achieve individual, team, and organizational objectives. So we see just in the basic definitions, right, not in the experience yet, but in the definitions, these two professions um, and ways of being, I would say, have very similar definitions. They're connecting with people, motivating others to do something, whether it's learn or achieve an objective. So it's that process of uh, connecting with another person. And they both uh, require us in order to be effective. We need both. We need to, to do the first one well. We need to motivate and connect, and we also need to create that environment that, that is uh, meaningful and effective for people. So we absolutely need both. Okay, so what is at the heart of this then? Uh, many of us are subject matter experts in what we know, and that basically, for the most part, becomes what we know is what we try to impart to others uh, or share with others uh, and the way we go about things. But we also need uh, the uh, that ability to connect. So that brings us to the topic of, geez, what are these skill sets then that one would need to be effective both in teaching and in leadership? Okay, well, I think we all know what hard skills are. Um, it's basically our is academic knowledge and know-how, right? You know, what is the subject matter all about? And that's an easy thing to define, right? It's measurable. Um, we can learn it. It's specific. Um, it's in the book, right? So uh, that's what we know. And and it's people's records of, of the results of experiments. So it's tangible. We can see it. We can and and we can measure that. And it's often the focal point of education is to prepare people uh, for job related skills. Uh, if we take it out of the education realm, you know, for parents really to teach their children, right, how to live in the world. So it, it is a focal point um, of preparing, you know, preparing people uh, to, to, to do something, but also to grow and, and uh, be better in generally uh, many aspects of their lives. So hard skills. Um, soft skills, I know that you've heard this buzzword and, and it's a buzzword, <laughs> and it's also a very expanded definition these days. Um, when I was uh, just, you know, researching a little bit about what is in the category of soft skills, the list was getting longer and longer and longer. Um, the, the definition that I use and I like is the heart of really what it is. And that is, it's really what we call people skills and interpersonal skills. How do, how do we get along with others? Um, how do we get to know and uh, communicate with others? So it's that, it's that people connection ability. So that's really at the heart of soft skills. And of course, you're like, well, what does that look like? Well, it's actually quite a, hard to measure. I think we know it when we see it. We definitely know it when we feel it, but it is difficult to define. But the main thing about that, this one, gets learned really through life experience. And uh, one of the most important things is 
is that it gets it gets learned really uh, through experience, but also awareness. The heart, the ability to cultivate soft skills, really emanate from who we are. You know, our our character, right? Our moral quality, the principles we hold for ourselves, and our personalities, right? What are our personality traits? So the the root of soft skills. Uh, is going to come from who we are, right? And also our how we how we work, you know, our work habits that contribute, the way we go about things, uh, our ability to work well with others. So this is always the big mystery, right? What are these soft skills? And the answer is they're coming from us, and we can learn them and we can hone them. Um, okay, so there's a whole list of them. But today I'm going to focus on two most critical, I think, and the top two of the big list of soft skills. The first one is the skill of emotional intelligence. And I trust and assume that you have heard this before, this term before. It's been around for a while, um, but it has gained a lot of traction in recent years. Why? because emotional intelligence through research has really proven to be, if you don't have it, <laughs> you can't do it kind of thing. It's turned out to be a power skill, right? Uh, and so people are focusing a lot on that. It is the differentiator uh, really more than other factors in uh, a leader's of, of, or, or teacher, anybody really ability to be effective. So here's the definitions, definition I'm using uh, from, uh, Daniel Goleman. Uh, he uh, has written several articles and books on this, and he's a more contemporary uh, look and a definition, and his research is very contemporary on this. But what Daniel says is that emotional intelligence is the capacity, right, the know-how of recognizing your own feelings and those of others for motivating ourselves and for managing emotions well in both ourselves and in our relationships with others, right? So notice some of these words here, right? Our, recognizing our own, motivating ourselves, and then managing the emotions of others in relationship formats. And uh, here's a quote from uh, the late Dr. Warren Bennis, who says, emotional intelligence more than any other factor more than intelligence, quote, IQ, or expertise, accounts for 85 to 90% of success at work. IQ is a given, right? It's a threshold confidence. You need it, but it won't make you the star, but emotional intelligence can. So the differentiator for success um, in, in any field, whether it's leadership or teaching or anything is this uh, with this competency of emotional intelligence. Okay, so why do we want to study that? Uh, well, let's first look at it a little more deeply. Um, there's a personal level to it, like knowing ourselves, and then a social level to it, knowing others. And this is Goldman's model here. Hopefully you can all see it's a some of the type is a little small, but as you can see on the left side, with the little darker shaded side there, um, self-awareness and self-management, right? Self-awareness is knowing your own emotional makeup and self-managing is being able to manage your emotions. And part of managing your emotion, emotions is managing yourself and your motivation. What are your sources of mo motivation, right? Why are you here today? That's a source of your motivation. Right. So to, to know that about yourself, what what kind of gets you up in the morning, as we say, uh, on the on the right side of that chart is the social competencies. Right. The social awareness, meaning basically recognizing and understanding other people's emotions. Uh, I think we all know the basic emotions of 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 human life, um, but recognizing um, sometimes we you know, we're so interested in what's going on or getting to a solution or something like that or or imparting the knowledge that we forget to, under, you know, forget to recognize that, you know, how is this being received, right? 
what's going on with the person or the people. And then the relationship management um, is, is kind of the big, uh, the big area here because it involves all of the things that we have to do with other people, uh, we, whether we're working together with them in a team, collaborating, whatever, uh, or handling conflict. So it's, it's the big area um, that is probably the hardest area of all emotional intelligence is to work through those scenarios. But I think that we, the way we can understand why emotional intelligence is important is because uh, of this concept of resonating with another person. And this quote here um, talks to us about uh, something that we probably all have experienced. Most of us have been touched deeply by a few important people in our lives, people who, because of their feelings for us, and their actions have helped us to become who we are. So many of us have very influential people in our lives. And we could think back about those relationships um, and how they made us feel, right? And how um, we connected with them. They have become very important and memorable people in our lives. And Carl Jung, uh, the famous uh, psy so, uh, psychologist, a uh, child psychologist about adult development and people development, child development, human development, says, one looks back with appreciation to the brilliant teachers that we had. Uh, mute, please. But with gratitude, Kindly mute. gratefulness. Kindly mute yourself. Now, I'm going to have to stop if people are not muted. One looks back with appreciation to the brilliant teachers, but with gratitude to those who touched our human feelings. Touched our human feelings. The curriculum, meaning what we teach, is so much necessary raw material, but warmth, that feeling of being connected with someone, is the vital element for growing the plant and growing the soul of the child. So this ability, this ability through these suites of skills here that we're talking about, this emotional uh, intelligence skills, give us the power, it's power, there's energy in being able to resonate or connect with another human being. And that's where the power comes in. That's why emotional intelligence is considered one of the critical skills, critical soft skills. And at the heart of emotional intelligence, is that self-awareness. Who are we? You know, what is our personality? Who are we as individuals? How we present ourselves to the world? Um, what do other people think about us, right? Do we even know that? How are we perceived by others? And what is our behavior doing, right? <laughs> um, when we act, how do we affect others? So it's an awareness, you know, kind of putting ourselves under the microscope a little bit to say, how am I coming across, right? How am I coming across? How am I landing on others? Because if you're going to be a teacher, or you're going to be a leader to motivate others, right? You got to know, do I have, uh, you know, some of these skills to resonate, right? And and uh, how is it landing? How is my behavior landing on that? So that's the number one uh, uh, skill. Uh, obviously, we know through research, there's a big a connection between knowing yourself, being able to cultivate emotional intelligence skills and your effectiveness, right? And as we said um, before, um, self-awareness is the key element of emotional intelligence. Without that, we really can't build it, right? But it has been shown time and again to be a very important success factor, not only in our, our working lives, but in our general life. So it's it's a good set of skills. And and if you look back on people who have been effective or have affected you or people you admire, you think back of on some of how you felt and you'll realize that much of it uh, is probably that soft skill set of emotional intelligence. The second one, and this should come as no surprise, right? Because without it, nothing happens, right? Communication is everything. Uh, it's everything. And it has obviously the greatest uh, impact, right? 
Uh, it's the core of effective leadership. And that is absolutely vital, right? If we're going to gain people's trust, if we're going to try to harness their efforts and align them toward a goal, and if we're going to try to positively, you know, affect them to do something uh, different. So we got to talk, you know, obviously language is, is the key here. Language is very powerful. It's how we use language and how we get that language to resonate with others. Teaching. Wow. Look at me talking away here. <laughs> Teaching is all about communication. It is about those critical skills. Listening is usually listed as the first one. Listening, speaking, reading, presenting, writing, you know this. And teachers who got this down, you know, who, who hone their communication skills are prepared to instruct, advise, mentor people and become entrusted in their care. Notice the two words, again, gaining trust. Um, people who are entrusted to you, trust, right? So trust comes from being resonant with others, being credible, and being able to connect. And of course, communication is essential to that. The most important skill, and probably the one that is most underrated, and I think most of you have probably heard of this as well, is the skill of listening, right? We think about it, we were born with two ears and one mouth. Right. So that gives us a clue right there. That must be a priority. Right. Listening. OK. So we do know, again, this looks sounds very well. This is nothing new. You know, the best communicators are good listeners, those who listen well. And why is that? Because listening you know, brings us into that knowledge. All right. Of who who the other person is. And it. It, once we get that communication and that connection together, it can be the, the ground floor of building trust, respect, and openness. Okay, But active listening, hopefully you've heard this as well, um, is first and foremost about understanding the other person and then about being understood. So most of our research in the field of listening has told us that most people listen to respond, right? We're in a conversation or teachers up in front of the room um, and we're really listening in case we get asked a question, what's the answer, right? So <laughs> we're kind of almost naturally geared to say, oh, I'm, I'm listening because I'm listening for the facts. I'm listening for, you know, um, you know, something I need to know. So I'm, 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 wait, I'm picking out information that I, I want to know, right? Or I need to know. So we can maybe a little selective in that, or sometimes we're not really listening completely at all. So what what is this concept of active listening? And I've, I, uh, <clears throat> I'm citing this from the Center for Creative Leadership, which is a leadership institute, research-based institute here in the United States. Um, and it has a couple of steps to it when we're active listening, right? And the first one is probably one of the most challenging for all of us today. Um, and I say today because we're distracted a lot with our cell phones mostly, um, to pay attention, right? Be in that moment, focused, right? Paying attention. Because what when we pay attention, it's a form of respect, right? It's a form of respect. We're, we're, we're looking at the person and hopefully we're in the same room, but if we're not, we're looking if we can. In any case, we're paying attention. The second one is to withhold judgment. Okay, this is a tricky one now because this is the one <laughs> that happens automatically in us, right? We uh, know a person or don't know a person and uh, our, our human, um, uh, you know, tendency is to size them up real quick, right? <laughs> because that's how humans protect themselves, right? When they see somebody new or, or something. 
and and or they may have had experience with this person like oh i don't know about this person and they start to make judgments in their head They're like oh this person is this or this person is going to be difficult to deal with or whatever and all of that noise starts getting in the way we start judging so we have to suspend judgment we have to step back right why do we want to step back because we got to if, if we're going to listen and absorb what this person is saying and, and understanding their need um, or understanding their understanding about what we're what we've taught or what we're saying, we have to we cannot jump in our mind. So we have to hold that back. Okay. So pay attention, withhold judgment, and then as the individual is talking, there's there's a skill of reflection. We paraphrase. This is what I think I heard you say. Um, you know, so that you're mirroring what that person said and you're connecting because when that when you hear the person who has listened say something to you and it's it's correct or they've got it mostly correct in their understanding that makes you feel like oh i was heard right or if the reflection is not necessarily really correct uh you have this opportunity to engage in what uh, you know, about clarifying it. So that's the next step. So you can reflect, this is what I think I heard. Did I get this right? Right. And then the person may talk again, and then you clarify that. You sort of summarize what you heard. And then, then, and only then, you share what perhaps your suggestion is or your advice or whatever uh, situation you're in. But as, as I said, it, it's a step, as you can see, it's a, it's a slowing down, paying attention, with don't jump to conclusions, right? Don't think of the answer. Don't jump in your mind. Uh, listen carefully, obviously. Reflect, clarify, summarize, and then, only then, can we uh, really deliver a thoughtful sharing and and position our our message ac according to what this person has said or feel. So it's a little bit of a, a slowed down, thoughtful way of listening and it doesn't take a whole lot longer to do that so active listening and then communication um, the way we ask questions and this is really uh, important I think for um, for people who are in the teaching profession uh, in particular or any profession really where Results are important. I'm not saying results are not important. People have to know the facts. They they do need to know. Okay, so it's part of inquiry uh, when we teach to ask what we call closed questions, right? Closed questions look for the facts, right? However, because they are closed, they limit responses usually to one or two words, right? So some of those words, you know, uh, begin with, you know, uh, sort of yes or no, who did this, right? One or, you know, one or two answers, like, um, is this is this a right assumption, yes or no? You know, so it, it doesn't involve too much thinking, right? It's just, just an immediate response that you would get from the individual. So um, th that doesn't really help us understand that person, right? And where they are with their learning uh, or what their need is. When we ask open-ended questions, that's those are designed to elicit a meaningful response based on the person's thoughts and feelings or knowledge. Right. So what do those questions begin with? What and how mostly. Uh, when I was going through my coaching um, training, we had a whole session. Uh, they gave us scenarios and we had a whole session where we had to practice asking every question with why we could squeeze in a little how every now and then but we were trained to ask every question starting with what the why is there too but it needs to be used sparingly because why can go either way right on, on the closed or oh, it can shut down the thinking if, if it's used sort of in a negative like why did you do that why do you feel that way so why do you feel that way or, you know, why versus, well, tell me more about what, what led you to that conclusion, right? There's a different way of asking the same question. 
But if you use what was it or what is it about this or that that made you come up to that conclusion, tell me more, right? You've invited that person to show you their thinking and their feeling. So these simple techniques, uh, I, I picked the top two, active listening, right? And asking open-ended questions, right? They get you much further along in your ability to connect with that person, understand the person or the student. And they really are the bedrock, right? Of the top two things that we, are, we do as leaders, we motivate and uh, is the first one, right? And that brings us to what I call the three R's of both leadership and teaching, right? And they are experiential things that our learners um, or our followers um, will feel and perceive, right? And, and leadership and, and, and having an effective teaching experience is how you, you are being perceived as the main role model. So the first one, of course, I think you probably guessed this one, you know, respect, obviously respect, isn't it? Being treated with courtesy and respect enables people to perform and learn better, right? If you feel disre disrespected, discounted, small, nah, that, that doesn't open the mind for sure for anything, so. Simple courtesy and respect. Are we relatable? Right here comes the soft skills, right? Um, are we approachable, personable, likable? Do people like us? <laughs> Not that we're you're, we're having a personality contest here, but if you're if you're approachable, if you're like, if you can, people can relate to you. They're more apt to be engaged, ask questions, share information. That's what we want, right? I want that. And as I mentioned, the big word resonance, right? That connected, uh, personal connection shows what? That you care and you can connect to them. You recognize them as individuals and you make them feel appreciated and valued, right? So when people are heard, um, they feel more valued, right? When they feel more valued you, and you're open, they can relate to you. And there's that exchange, right? Their minds are open. They're not fearful. They're ready. Right? And that brings us to the next thing is leaders motivate and create the environment. So what are these three eyes? These three eyes have to do with the environment, right? So our, our followers and our learners, right? If the environment is set such that it's an inclusive environment, it sends the message that everybody matters, right? Everybody belongs, everybody has a unique contribution to make, right? So it's not closed, it's open. You've made it interesting. How do you make something interesting, right? You connect, right? What you're saying, what you're, what you're hoping to achieve, your goal, uh, with the learning experience, right? But you're connecting it to something real world that people can relate to. And when they see it in that way, then they tend to understand it better, right? When you've explained it in a way that, oh yes, I've experienced that. And then they become more curious and they, and they, they uh, also, um, you know, stimulates curiosity, but it, it also, May, when when they connected with something that they know, then it shows us that they truly understand the meaning and the meaning of something. They're not regurgitating back a fact that they have absolutely no connection with. That's not learning. That's regurgitating facts. That's rote, right? So we want them to connect and 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 apply apply this concept that we've just shared with them. And then interaction, uh, obviously. It's, it's all about conversation, discussion, bringing people together, you know, having them touch, feel, work with stuff, work with peers, work in groups, um, just making it very engaging, right? Uh, creates, you know, a, an active energy kind of environment. Now, there's a term for, for all of this, uh, which we'll get to in a second, but 
the fundamental skill here is that um, excellent teachers and leaders do build what we call a culture of safety, safety, and the environment that fosters learning. So what kind of safety are we talking about? And we're here talking about a term called psychological safety. I think you have probably heard of this as well. It sounds like, oh my God, what's that? It's a big word. Woo. Okay. The word was coined really by um, Amy Edmondson, who is a professor at Stanford University. And she did a big project with Google. Uh, it was called the Aristotle Project with Google. Google. And she was, she was uh, you know, did this research. She talked to, to all kinds of people who worked there because it was a very sort of team-based uh, culture. People worked together, collaborated a lot. And she was trying to figure out what is the secret sauce here? What is the magic of how Google is able to do what they do? And she came up with the fact that people felt safe. They were free of fear, which she called, her book is called The Fearless Organization, but they were free of fear. Fear of what? Fear of not being punished or humiliated for speaking up with ideas, questions, concerns, or mistakes. So she called that psychological safety psychological safety. So what does that look like? Well, uh, this uh, people have extracted this and say, okay, here are some examples of what psychological safety looks like. And here, here's one in the learner space, right? A safe to innovate, ask some questions, try something new, make a mistake and learn from it, look for new opportunities, right? So it's learner safety examples. Challenger safety. It's okay to challenge the status quo, to speak up, express ideas, uh, identify a possible change, right? Expose a problem, right? It's okay. It's okay to, to speak those things. Inclusion safety. It's safe to know that it's an environment where people feel that they're all being treated fairly, uh, that you can express your experience and ideas. Um, it, it's you don't have to be the most senior person in the room. Now, I know in some cultures that are hierarchical, this would not apply. <laughs> uh, but there are ways where we can include everyone, even the most junior people, um, in discussions we want to hear from them, right? As well as the most senior. So they all have ideas. Um, and the collaborators, collaborators safe to do, basically interact well with others. Uh, you know, foster a, an active, constructive debate if we have one. So this this could go even more on the administrator side of all of our jobs, uh, working through administration and that sort of thing. So that's the uh, a very, um, I think, deep dive uh, sort of description of what psychological safety looks like for people. So when people feel safe and not fearful, their psychological, their minds are open. You look at the um, people have done uh, in neuroscience have done studies. They've run MRIs on people's brains, right? When they are um, do, doing things where they're fearful, right? Um, and, or when they're happy and they see different, different uh, sides of the brain lighting up. Okay. So this brings us really to these concepts may have seem a little new to you perhaps, or maybe a little strange, like, wow, hmm. But I hope you do see the connection between the soft skills and the hard skills. We need both, always we need both. The soft skills of emotional intelligence and of communication and of creating these psychologically safe environments. Because those are the, those are the ingredients of which will make us more effective. And I also want to go over what is the current thinking, the emergent thinking on leadership. Okay, when in the past, I'm going to say in the past, because it's now deep in the past, we never teach this anymore. We go over the major leadership theories of what is a leader. Um, and, you know, we have all kinds of examples of leaders in history, you know, um, and people sometimes jump to those descriptions. But when we talk about leadership today, 
you talk about it in the context of a couple of things. And this is, of course, based on uh, a lot of research and, and findings about what leadership really is, right? It's that ability, right? It's the ability to motivate and the ability to create that environment, right? So the, the latest thinking is that leadership is really not a title or position. Oh, yeah, formal leadership is if you got a title of CEO or you know, superintendent or principal of a school. Yeah, that's a title or position. You have what we call formal authority. But the act of leadership is really not a title or position. In fact, uh, Brene Brown, who's a social psychologist, she says, you know, she, had, she wrote a book calling Dare to, Dare to Lead. But she says, anyone who's responsible for finding the potential in people and in processes can be a leader. Finding the potential, right? That means we need to resonate and know who they are. But anyone who has the responsibility to do that can be a leader. Second concept is leadership is distributed. It's not resonant in the top people only, right? Anybody can cultivate these habits, um, these mindsets, these skill sets, and be able to be effective with others. And in fact, Daniel Goldman tells us there are many leaders, not just one. Um, it, leadership resides not only in the people at the top, but every person at every level in one way who acts as a leader to a group of followers wherever they are in an organization. Daniel Goleman, our emotional intelligence guy. And we have examples of who leaders are today in organizations, wherever the organization is and whatever type. They are people who create new knowledge and technology. They are the challengers of the status quo. They are the enabler of action, enablers of actions in others. They are caretakers of the well-being of others, and they are teachers and nurturers of values and learning. Leader, leadership is a mindset that can be cultivated. It can be learned. So new thinking on leadership. I also did my homework when I was preparing this presentation and I ran across some research that was very interesting. And it talked about the self-concept of teachers, what teachers think about their roles, right? So the goal of this research was to investigate the leader identity of teachers in the context of their roles as classroom teachers. Okay, so this group of professors did this, right? And what they found is that teachers felt their role was to engage and enhance the student's learning and intellectual growth. However, they seldom perceive themselves to be in a leadership role. So this was a really interesting study. But when we are in a leadership role, you know, we are a role model, right, for, for our students, for our followers. We are a role model for them. We are, we, they are in our care, right? And how we go about things, right? How we present ourselves, how we connect with them, right? The methodologies that we use, the engagement that we convey and bring in, that, that teaches them as much as the subject matter, right? So teachers don't normally think of themselves as leaders. And that was one of my goals today to say, yeah, you are. <laughs> Um, but to have that mindset um, requires what we call a growth mindset. And I think you have seen this before because I was able to find this icon in the Hindustan Times. Okay, so this one is everybody has been around for a while, the growth mindset, fixed and growth mindset. But um, Carol DeWick says here, people who believe their talents can be developed, right? Leadership at all levels, leadership can be skills that are learned through hard work, good strategies, and input from others, have a growth mindset, right? So they can learn this. And they tend to achieve more 
than those with a fixed mindset who believes that their talents are fixed and innate. They're just born with them and they can't be learned. So this Hindustan, Hindustan Times uh, graphic here, um, you know, talks about the, they crossed out the fixed mindset word. So if you don't know something, find out, right? Um, don't take something as criticism, but ask for feedback, an opportunity for growth, right? Don't be envious of people. Uh, admire them and look look for examples of why they're effective, you know, why you can resonate, why you connect. Not jealous because of, of the title that they have, but really who they are. And problem, you know, pro is it a problem? Yeah, it's always a problem. But is there opportunity? Maybe. So it's kind of flipping the mindset, right, from uh, positive to negative, um, and and realizing that we can all grow and we can all learn um, throughout our lives. So I lead you leave you with a quote that I found that I think really pretty sums it up. It says, um, "A mediocre teacher tells, the good teacher explains, the superior teacher demonstrates." but the great teacher inspires. The great teacher is a leader. Okay, time for questions. How did we do? We did pretty well <laughs> on time. Thank you so much, ma'am, uh, for such a valuable program and enriching idea, ma'am. Of uh, us being the aspiring teachers, it is very important for us to keep this mindset, this growth mindset. So uh, right now, I would request uh, participants to write down their questions so that uh, ma'am can interact and discuss about them. If you have any query or if you want to know anything more about this topic, kindly write your uh, questions on the chat box so that ma'am can uh, explain it. Uh, somebody has raised uh, his or her hand. So I would request uh, him or her to unmute uh, uh, yourself and just uh, ask if you have anything to ask. I have a question of people if they can answer on the chat board. Um, did you hear anything new? Probably not. I don't know. <laughs> well. Maybe we're thinking. Okay, so how can we improve uh, self-communication within our classrooms? Okay, so I, I'm not quite sure what you mean by self-communication. Uh, you mean share yourself of who you are? Is that is that what it is? I need, I need a little bit more clarification of the question. Anindita, you can unmute yourself and can ask the question. 
saying yes. Okay, so in some ways to do it are uh, obviously if you're being introduced to your class at this at the very first, you tell a little story about yourself. So storytelling is always a good way to share something about yourself, right? Why you became a teacher, you know, what interested you in that? And, you know, what are some of the things that, um, you know, you expect or, or you know, uh, that you learned when you learned impressed you about your teacher and just just the whole a little bit of sharing why your why your teacher um, what impressed you about teaching that made you want to be a teacher uh, a little bit about your background so they know obviously you were you've been taught before by other people um, you know why you studied what you did so personal sharing really um, about yourself and um, so that's one thing uh, in part you know self communication a little talking a little bit about yourself right so who you are why you study what you did how you feel about teaching what your goals are for learning now this for grammar school children you have to adjust all of this to your audience right that's the main thing when you're communicating with anyone make sure you understand your audience where are they <laughs> in their maturity level uh, where are they in their willingness to learn? You know, just understand your audience and then your, make your pitch according to uh, what you think will connect with them. But I, you don't need to share uh, intimate facts about your life and everything like that, but just a little bit about who you are, how you think. Um, you could share some personal information if you want. Like I used to be really shy until I got really excited about this particular subject. And then I, the more I became excited, the more I learned, the more I, I wanted to share with others. And I became a little bit more comfortable speaking in front of other people. And here I am today in the front of the classroom, these sorts of things, personal stories. So make it more of a storytelling thing and give examples and you'll be more relatable. Thank you, ma'am. Ma'am, I have a question. Ma'am, uh, can you share some tips and tricks for us? Like we are the aspiring teachers, so it would be really great if you can share some tips and tricks to interact and to hold the confidence. Yeah. Um, tips and tricks is something we don't do in, in, in leadership anymore because there's no one size fits all. And I think that would be the number one tip I could say to give you that there's really no tips and tricks to this thing. Um, uh, for as far as teaching, yes, absolutely. There are tips and tricks for methodology, right? Pedagogy, how people learn. So I would say the, the number one thing is, is um, again, understand the level of of maturity of the learner, right? Um, and and try to gear the exercises, the pitch, the conversation. Uh, you for younger people, for all people, really, they want to be interactive with the information. So so gear it toward making them in, interact with the information and and, and uh, interact with others. Have discussions about things. Present concepts give examples. So make your teaching um, interactive. Uh, understand your audience, make your teaching um, as under, interactive as possible and connected to real life. And ask them, ask them in class, you know, well, how do you see this play out? Or, you know, have you seen this before in real life? Examples of this, what we just talked about. So have them connect with the material and interact, I would say are two um, pedagogicals or, you know, tips <laughs> that I would give. Um, as far as, you know, developing your style as a leader, uh, your style as a teacher, um, how you resonate with others, that, that's a, that's all about self-awareness, right? That's all, and that's, there's no real tips and trips on that because it's going to be, it has to be natural, has to be who you are and you have to, that has to come from who you are. So there isn't a recipe book for that one. But there's a lot of pedagogical examples out there. Um, the, the one thing that really doesn't work um, is just telling. <laughs> you know, telling just uh, don't tell. You know, interact and make it live for people. Yeah.
can't Thank give you, you so the, I can't, I yes, can't give you, a, I can't give you a sheet of, <laughs> of tips and tricks, um, but just know your audience. That's, that's, that's really the heart of it. And then you can design from there. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am. So, uh, so, um, anybody wants to say anything, want to ask? They can just simply write the question on the chat box. Okay, so we do have one uh, question that popped up. Um, we have different kinds of students with different temperaments. Um, how can we establish connection with all the students? Okay, so um, if your class is, is reasonably sized, I don't know what size classes you have, but if they're reasonably sized, uh, it's very helpful to get to know um, each, each person a little bit right? Um, by just spending some time with them, you know, either before or after class, just, just asking them some questions. Um, how are they doing today? And, you know, what did they think of today's uh, lecture, that kind of thing. So you get a feeling for individual temperament first. And if you have certain individuals in class uh, that may, you know, uh, be the type that's very, very quiet, you haven't heard anything from them in weeks, you know, you, you talk to them a little bit, right? You talk to them and say, hey, you know, what's up? <laughs> I noticed you're very quiet. Can I help with anything? Um, if you have someone that's the class clown and acting, ah, well, and somebody that's over talking all the time and hogging the conversation, not letting anybody else talk, you know, you, you either have to sometimes pull them aside and say, hey, you know, we, I want, I want everybody to have an opportunity to speak in this class and, you know, and, and set the rules for the class. Again, age appropriate. That's what we do a lot of times in uh, when we kick off a class or or something. We say, you know, what are what are the ground rules for this class, right? What are the ground rules, right? Be respectful, right? Participate. What does that mean? <laughs> uh, don't over participate. Allow others to speak. You know, these sorts of things. So, I mean, you set the ground rules sometimes for class and you keep them. Make sure you enforce them. And sometimes you can ask the class, again, depending on the age, how should we be in this class, right? What, you know, should we allow chaos in here? No, absolutely not. How should we be? Just ask them. They'll tell you. <laughs> they will tell you. So you can do that. Um, so, um Again, so I think that's know them in some some people individually, especially if you think they're outliers of some sort, um, and then set some ground rules for the class, right? To to say the the uh, temperament of the class, and then you know, as I said, be relatable, right? Be open to questions, right? and encourage questions. That's that's how you can establish a connection, you know, with the students. Right, that make them feel included in the discussion, right? Not just sitting there taking notes for whatever the hour and then getting up and leaving. No, no. Um, so ask, ask, your, ask a lot of questions, <laughs> those open ended questions to the class and encourage people to speak up. Um, I don't like to randomly call on people. Uh, I have done it on occasion just to stimulate <laughs> discussion. Um, but I don't usually like to do that. I, I usually like to set it so that the information is interesting so that somebody will have a comment or a suggestion or something like that. So may, work on the environment, right? Work on being, being open for discussion. 
and encourage discussion. And if you if you have crickets like we had today, nobody's speaking up. It's okay. I just want to hear from three people. You know, sometimes we do that in class. I just want to hear from three people. Who's who's going to be up? Who's going to be the one to stand up? So we we do that kind of thing too. So you, just little tri tricks. Those are some tricks that you can learn as well. Okay. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, I hope. Yes. Thank you, Amrita. Okay. Well, well, thank you for inviting me. I I hope it was uh, at least thought provoking in some way. Uh, that's uh, that's one of the main jobs I think of, uh, as I said, of, of teaching is to um, have people think. That's one of the goals. So. Okay. Well, I said thank you for inviting me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, ma'am. Um, I wish you all well. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for the admirable discussion. We all assimilated and retained a lot from today's session, ma'am. Thank you so much. So now we are standing at the very end of the session. To begin with, I would like to thank Professor Dr. Shamit Ray. Chancellor of Adamus University, Professor Dr. Navin Das, Vice Chancellor of Adamus University for their continuous support and ha my heartiest gratitude to the conveyor of this session, Dr. Shauli Mukherjee, Director of School of Education and Associate Dean of School of Liberal Arts and Cultural Studies, Adamus University, for her eternal supervision and assistance. My sincere thanks to Dr. Pragya Mohanty, ma'am, Associate Professor and HOD, Head of the Department, School of Education, Adamus University, for her constant support and encouragement. My profound regard to Dr. Akigun, ma'am, the coordinator of the session, Assistant Professor, School of Education, Adamus University, for her continuous effort and advices. And definitely to all the respected dignitaries for their strenuous effort to make this session a grand success. I am on behalf of School of Education, Adamus University, once again wishes to express our gratitude and ardent thanks to the person, to our resource person for this session, Dr. N. M. Ferrante, for her engrossing session and insight on teaching is leadership. My earnest appreciation to all the participants for their consistent stay and responses. Looking forward to such sessions and enriching lead and transfer of ideas and visions soon. Thank you all. Have a great day ahead. Thank you, ma'am.